Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am really glad you have joined us today. Um, I have a really exciting guest on today and um, you are going to be so encouraged by him. He is actually, um, well, he and his whole family are good friends of ours. We've known them for well over 20 years and um, I think you're going to enjoy what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about being a teacher in the public school system in California and why he homeschools his kids. Um, so his name is Caleb Schrader, and I'm excited for you to get to know him. So hi, Caleb. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast today. Um, we actually interviewed you for Schoolhouse Rocked, the movie, yep. about a little over two years ago, right? Yeah. 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 And so for those of you who are on, actually, I want to say who are on the Backstage Pass membership site, but I actually think that your video has... Um, been seen by people who are not Backstage Pass members. I think we made that available um, to people for free. And we will actually do that again. Um, we can talk about that at the end of the show, but people can go to the show notes um, for this podcast and see your video. But you had a great interview, um, talked about spiritual leadership in your home and just about how you come alongside of your wife and encourage her. And so that's a great video that you guys definitely are going to want to see. But today we're going to talk about something a little bit different with you. Um, on kind of the other side of homeschooling, and that is public schools. Um, so before we get rolling on that topic, tell us about you and your family a little bit. Um, so I'm the father of six kids, um, and all six of my kids are homeschooled. My oldest is 14. She just started high school, just finished the first semester of her freshman year. Um, and then I have a 12-year-old daughter who is in seventh grade. I have twin boys who are nine years old. I have a daughter who's seven, and then the youngest is four and a half. Um, we, use a, we use a classical model for education. Um, we love classical conversations, and we've been doing that for, I think, four years now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm a practicum speaker. I usually um, speak at different practicums over the summer. I love encouraging homeschool parents. Um, my wife and I are actually both homeschool graduates. We, uh, we are homeschooled K through 12. Um, in the 80s and 90s when you had to do that with your curtains closed and the phone <laughs> turned off um, in California. Um, and, uh, and we love what we're able to do with our kids uh, with homeschooling. I'm, I'm a public school teacher. I'm really involved in ministry at my church, um, both in my kids' ministries and then I, I direct the college ministry at my church. Yeah, well, you guys are busy. You're a busy, busy bunch. Um, we love your family dearly. We are good friends with you guys. And um, as a matter of fact, your wife, Leah, and I are really good friends. And her parents, the first time we met, I think Leah was like 12. And her parents were mine and Garrett's pre-marriage counselors. Yeah. And that was 24 years ago. That was actually a little over that 24 years ago because um, we are just celebrating our 24th anniversary. So oh, we, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. All, only by the grace of God. Um, so it's been really neat to see your family um, grow. I know I got to be kind of a little part of, of helping with your wedding. And um, so we've, we've seen your, your family grow from the very beginning. And yeah. hi. <laughs> There's my oldest. I'm yeah. in her room because that's where the internet connectivity is the best. <laughs> right, right. So for those watching this on video, that's Sophie in the back. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I love um, your story of, of having been homeschooled to where God has brought you today. And I was talking to somebody recently and she said, you know, I, I don't see that a lot of homeschool graduates are doing a lot of things and being really successful in life. Now, this is someone who comes... Um, from who does not come from a background of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, the reason that you may not see that quite yet is because that whole first big generation of homeschool graduates are just now really into their adulthood. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're in their maybe late twenties to mid thirties um, and really starting to shine as mm -hmm. adults. And um, so you're one of those where God has done some amazing things with you. Um, talk a little bit first about what your homeschool journey was like growing up, because I know you were, I don't want to say, I mean, you might say unschooled, but I, I won't say that you were unschooled, but I know you had kind of a loose school structure um, yeah. growing up and then to where you are today and what, what God has done with you. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but my dad um, was a public school teacher for 37 years. He was teaching high school um, and that's what sort of motivated him to make the decision to homeschool. Um, 
it wasn't it wasn't necessarily because he wanted to um, protect us from indoctrination. He just saw the system was broken. Educationally, students were not learning. They were not being taught. Um, and so he realized I could do this better on my own. Um, and, and he did. Um, I just finished my second master's degree. Most of my siblings have master's degrees. A lot of us are um, very successful working professionals. Um, but because he because his response wasn't to try to maybe pull us out and protect us from the system it was very educationally focused um he had some radical ideas about how he was going to educate educate us and um so, some people might describe it as unschooling but it wasn't because our mathematics was very structured so mathematics was something that we did every day we had to we had to put in time we had to work systematically through he wrote our curriculum for mathematics hmm. for reading that was very structured reading was very structured um, and he sort of designed it like those are the keys if you have your math you have your reading you can do anything mm -hmm. and so outside of that it was more um, whatever our passion was so like um, I remember one year um, when I was in high school instead of doing U.S. history I just spent the entire year doing research on George Washington mm -hmm. he just fascinated me and so I just I did also this research on him and I sort of I learned U.S. history by studying the life of George Washington right um, and so that, that's, that was sort of the unschooling bit is it was a little bit passion driven, but the, the math and the, and the English portion were, were very structured. My dad is a strict grammarian. Um, even in my master's, um, graduate programs, I would send my research papers to him and say, <laughs> Hey, can you check my grammar? And he would always inevitably <laughs> find something. I was hoping after my second master's degree, I'd finally arrive where he wouldn't be able to find any errors, but he can, he could always see them. Yeah. Um, so our, our experience, because, because he really structured the math and the reading, we're able to excel in anything we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And we're also able to keep our passion. So I'm still somebody who's extremely passionate about learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you learned to love learning. Yeah. Um, which is really the purpose of education. Um, yeah. It's not just to put a bunch of facts into our kids' heads so that they forget them after the test and then move on to the next subject. Yeah. It's really to teach our kids how to love learning. Exactly. Uh, so, so how did he do that with you? What, what was the key that you found that caused you to love learning and how are you doing that with your kids? So I would say the key um, was having enough structure so that we could acquire the tools necessary to be successful. Um, let me, let me illustrate it this way. When I was taking a, um, I was taking a PE class when I was in college on teaching PE to, to students. Um, my, my degree was in education. And, um, and our professor was explaining to us, she's like, this is the most important class you're going to take. And a lot of sort of people laughed that off. Well, this is a PE class. This is, this is important. This is not important. And she explained that um, people's quality of life is tied towards how active they are. And she said people aren't active if they're not skilled enough to enjoy activity. And so when you, teach a, when you teach a child how to throw a ball correctly, when you teach them how to jump correctly, when you teach them how to run correctly, they can, they can then enjoy those activities. In the same way with education, if your mind is equipped where you understand um, the inner workings of mathematics, so you have, um, your, your brain automatically sees the logic and systems, looks for the logic, understands how to put it together, and then, and then you can read, um, you can do anything. So the, the first key was having that structure in place there. But the second key was um, my dad and my mom were, were passionate learners themselves. Mm -hmm. So their, their passion was, was caught by us. They were excited. My dad um, was a biologist. So everywhere we went, he was just pointing out the wonder of what he saw. And it wasn't faked at all. It was just like he was in awe of God's creation. Mm -hmm. so everywhere we'd go, we'd spend a lot of our summers up at Mount Whitney here in California. And we'd spend a lot of time on the trails and hiking around. And he'd just be showing us all these things as we're, as we're hiking. And we'd be looking at the stars at night and he'd be teaching us. So ev the, the world was our classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because of that, um, ev everywhere I go, I want to learn. I was I was going on a run this morning um, with this lady who was, um, I, there's a, a local running store and they do like a run there every single Saturday morning. And I was running with this lady who is a, um, she has a PhD in nuclear fission. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. She can answer all these questions that I have. And so I was just like grilling her while I was running. Um, and it's not some, that's not something that I'm researching, but it's fascinating to me. I want, I want to know about it. So everywhere I go, 
I'm, I'm asking people questions, trying to learn about the world that's around me. So I just have, we're born with an innate curiosity and the school mm-hmm. system destroys that. Yeah. Um, and I've been able to preserve that. So I have the same curiosity I did as a five-year-old. I never lost it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're passing that on to your kids now, just like your dad passed that on to you. Yep. Which is awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I want to take a quick break for um, a sponsor ad, but I want to come back because I really want to get into this conversation about public schools and what's happening in the public school system um, as you see it, because you are in it. So we're going to break for just a second, then we will be right back. I have to make note of it. Um, okay, we are back with Caleb. Um, so Caleb, you are a public school teacher. You teach math. Um, do you only teach math or do you teach other subjects as well? Um, yeah, primarily math. Um, okay. uh, this, this year I'm doing a study hall. I teach um, a lot of dual enrolled students. So okay. I work for a, a local community college and I work for the high school. Um, and so I have a lot of students who are enrolled in the community college classes and the high school classes. So I, I run a study hall for them to come in and get help with their homework and just sort of stay on top of them and make sure they're getting work done. So it's not, it's not math per se, yeah. but I end up he- helping them with a lot of mathematics. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's the question. You are a public school teacher and many would ask the question, then why would you not have your kids in public school? You know, if you, if you own a business, maybe creating, oh, who knows what, I don't know, um, (laughs) t-shirts, you would obviously want your kids to wear that t-shirt that you create because that's your, that's your thing. That's your family business. That's what feeds your family. Mm -hmm. And so you, every day you go into the public school system and you have decided that that's not what's right Mm -hmm. for your kids. Why is that? You know, um, I I guess it, it might seem strange from the outside, but because that's how I was raised, it was sort of assumed um, mm-hmm. It wasn't assumed that I would become a teacher, but it was assumed that I would um, homeschool my kids. Um, the system's broken, and it, it's broken beyond repair. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, education is a um, – there's, there's so much political activism in education now um, that the working professionals who, who actually know what's best for students and what's going what's gonna to help them cognitively, um, we can't even do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't, we can't teach students where they're at um, because we're working with 30 or more students at a time. Um, we have to force everybody to sit into the same, fit into the same cookie cutter mold. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, become, it becomes indoctrination. Public school flowed out of the Industrial Revolution. And in the Industrial Revolution, it actually made sense for what they were trying to do. Um, in the Industrial Revolution, they needed a good factory worker. They needed somebody who would clock in, do the same mundane, mundane tasks without any asking any questions, and then clock out. Um, we don't have those jobs anymore. We don't have any careers. Um, yeah, there are some factory workers, but if you look at it, the majority of what factory workers are doing now is they're troubleshooting. They're working on the equipment because the right. equipment does the work that a, that a worker used to do. Mm-hmm. Um, our, our education system is the same as it was 100 years ago. Um, and because of that, we're still preparing students to go into a job where they don't think about what they're doing. They don't know how to troubleshoot. They're just really good at what I call regurgitating on command. Mm-hmm. Um, so the teacher tells them, okay, here's everything you need to know. Come back tomorrow and recite it to me. Um, that's useless. There's no, there's, no, there's no value in that at all um, in our culture anymore. Um, mm-hmm. So no matter, no matter what like your religious background, but just cognitively looking at what the brain needs to be effective for a for a worker to be able to be successful those skills aren't given um, at all anymore Mm -hmm. Um, and so i made the decision to to educate my my kids primarily because i saw that i saw how broken the system was um why i'm why i'm in the system it's not that i necessarily think that i can change it um I felt like I could. I'm, I'm teaching at a small rural high school. And um, I, have a, I have a principal who gave me a lot of freedom. Um, and we were able for about five years to be extremely innovative, um, mm-hmm. drastically change within the confines of what California restricts us to, drastically change sort of how we set up math instruction. Um, and we're, we're really 
really successful. I have, I have a student right now at Harvard medical, um, mm-hmm. graduated yeah. from my, graduated from my program. He's gonna, he's gonna be a medical doctor. Wow. Um, and, uh, and I have students who are at UCLA. And so like I was able to create an atmosphere where I was able to sort of salvage the student's education in their last three years. The school is small enough that I had students for three years and I could get them to that point where they became autonomous learners. Mm-hmm. And I sort of shocked that curiosity back inside of them. Um, but that, that's an anomaly. Usually you don't have a principal who will give you that freedom. Um, and and that whole system um, was dependent upon the administration I had and that administration just shifted and my new administration will not work with me at all. Hmm. Um, and so they're coming in and they're dictating and then they're, they're destroying everything I built, um, which is sort of that's that standard fare in California public schools. Sure. Um, education is determined by the politicians. Mm-hmm. A big thing for mathematics, every single incoming freshman that I have, I'm required to put them in an algebra one class. Um, I'll give them a, an entrance test and they can't add a fraction. They can't multiply single digits. Um, they never got through, if you guys are familiar with the classical uh, method, they never got through those grammar stages. Mm-hmm. They never mastered that grammar stage. They were never taught to mastery and they need that. You can't go on if right. you understand sort of how the brain works. You can't go on to that dialectic or, or rhetoric stage until you have the grammar of a subject down, but I'm required to put them in an algebra class. Wow, it's like is, building the roof first on a house before you've built the foundation. Exactly, yeah, it'd be like putting a student in their third year Spanish class when they haven't <laughs> had Spanish one or two. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's just because the government requires us to do that. And it's yeah. because algebra is a social justice issue. Instead of being a math issue, it's a sh- social justice issue. And there, there are social justice components. There are for sure, you know, there's pockets of racism where people will put students in a class just to hold them down. Mm-hmm. But as a rule, that's really not happening in California, and it really shouldn't be how you determine what class students are put in. Um, so really the reason that I'm there is um, I, I never felt called to be a school teacher. I felt called to be a missionary, mm-hmm. and that's how I see it. Um, I think that the public schools are the front line of the, um, the culture war in our, in our nation today. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So if you want to be making a difference, the biggest difference that you can make is to be right there in the thick of it. Um, mm-hmm. So California, public schools, I'm like on the front line. And so, yeah. and, and how I shine my light in that is not by going out and, um, and lecturing my students about their immoral lifestyles. I love kids. I love kids. And um, students are attracted to the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is, is I'm able to develop relationships with them. They know that I, that my classroom is a safe space and they come in there and they share their hearts with me. They share their struggles and I'm able to share Jesus with them. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, one of the young guys I got to share Jesus yeah. with yeah. came to know the Lord and, and now he's a pastor at your, at your home church. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so just that that's, that's why I'm there. I'm there because, um, I've described it this way. The public schools are the cesspool of our society. Um, Mm -hmm. If you look around and you think, wow, you know, the media is bad and this is bad. Well, imagine the next generation that's raised by that generation with those lack of any moral um, compass whatsoever. Those, those children, um, their, their lifestyles, their moral compass, it's despicable. Mm -hmm. And to go into that, um, it's almost, uh, my, I, I'm passionate about missions. I love to, to read missionary stories. And that's, that's sort of how I've always envisioned it. And I'm sort of an anthropologist. I'm studying how these students work, how their minds work. How do I communicate to them? How do I get mm-hmm. through to them? So I can, so I can communicate the gospel to them. Yeah. Well, you do a good job of doing that. You know, you talk about being on the front lines and I did a podcast, um, a few weeks ago with, a um, homeschool mom named Misty Bailey. And we talked about, being salt and light in the public schools and how oftentimes that is the argument that Christian parents will say, we want to put our kids in the public school system because God calls us to be salt and light, Mm -hmm. but God does not call the student to be salt and light. He doesn't Mm -hmm. call a student who's not old enough to really understand what they believe yet. I mean, sure, they might believe in Jesus. Hopefully they do, but they're not really quite solid enough in their foundation as a child to be able to go out and stand against the forces of evil that are taking place in the public school system. Yeah. And so, 
So how, how do you answer that? I mean, if a parent says to you, well, you know, I, I don't want to homeschool my kids because I think God has called us to be salt and light. And so I want to put my kid in the public school system so that they can be the salt and light. What would you say to that parent? Um, I would ask them what they're doing to have such amazing kids who can go out there and be doing what I'm doing. That's exhausting me. That's really, really difficult. Um, but at the same, at the same time, um, I, I do know Christian parents in my, in my school who are very involved, you know, they're, they're on campus. And that's what I would say is, okay, I know that some, some parents can't homeschool their kids, just their life, their life situation doesn't allow them to do that for whatever reason. Um, my, my wife and I, we just, we make it happen. California is mm-hmm. pretty expensive to live here. So living yeah. on middle income, I got to work a couple jobs, but God is good. He provides for us. And so I know I've, I've talked to people sometimes where they feel like that's a necessity. And I say, well, you need to understand with that, that the responsibility for discipleship still lands squarely on your shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the problems is, um, when you, when you start, and trusting your education, the education of your children to somebody else, you can begin to think, um, well, maybe because I'm not educating them, I don't need to be as active in what's happening in their mind. And part of discipleship, it's, it's for sure spiritual, but you're also discipling your children's minds mm-hmm. and you need to be learning how they're thinking. Um, and if you can do that um, as a non-homeschool parent, parent, like more power to you. Um, but for myself, I can't. I need to. I need to be teaching my children at home. But one of the things that I saw as a homeschool graduate um, in in the 80s and 90s, a lot of my um, contemporaries, a lot of my peers, their parents were making that decision because they feared the culture. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is they completely removed their children from that culture. Right. And then those children, once they graduated, they weren't able to engage with that culture. Right. Um, we we have a mandate from our Lord to make disciples, which Mm -hmm. means we have to be interfacing with people who aren't yet disciples. We need to be fishers of men, which means we need to have venues where we're interacting with people who are in the world. And so I actively pursue that for my children. That's something my parents actively pursued for me. Um, So my, my kids, um, they, they interact with people outside of just our home and our homeschool community. Uh, my daughter was on my cross country team at my public high school this last year. Um, I think within the first two weeks, she'd shared the gospel with all the other freshman girls on the team. Wow. You know? And I mean, that's my heart. And she sort of knows, hey, that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, another another on, untapped venue that I think a lot of homeschool parents don't recognize is, is youth groups in the church. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes in a youth group, you're going to have unchurched kids coming in and visiting sure. and homeschool kids. That can be their, that can be the place that they learn to be salt and light. And so I think that parents who make that argument, there's, mm-hmm. there's something valid there and we need to, we need to own that and recognize that. And we need to stop and think, how are we in helping our children right now prepare to engage in the culture? Mm-hmm. We're training up a child, but part of training up a child is we need to be teaching them how to make disciples, you know? So it could be like your, their, their friend across the street that they mm-hmm. play with. Like, right. hey, you know, let me challenge you to, to invite them to come to church with you. Let me challenge you, you to, to tell them what it means to believe in Jesus, to share your faith with them. Um, I, I can remember as a little kid doing that and making a mess of it with my next door neighbor. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to, I, I asked him if he was a Christian and he said yes. And then I didn't know what to do because I knew he wasn't and I didn't want to argue with him. But my, that was something my parents did for me. They put me on, you know, the, the public um, parks and rec basketball teams and I would do swim teams. And so I was interacting with the world constantly and, mm-hmm. and learning how to be a witness. But my dad was my coach. Right. So he was right there watching me, encouraging me, but also giving me enough space so that I could learn to do those things. Yeah. Um, we can't just bring our children up to the place of being 18 years old. They graduate from high school and then they go out there and they're ready to engage in the world. Um, if the first time they ever hear somebody use profanity is after they graduate from home yeah. school, that's a problem. <laughs> right. you know? And so, I mean, yeah, my daughter probably learned some new words this last year as a, you know, she's actually 13 as a freshman mm-hmm. um, in the public school system. And, and she doesn't like that, but also I'm not worried about um, that affecting her because I know that her light is stronger mm-hmm. than those, those bad morals. And I know that she can, she can stand up on her own two feet. And that's really a decision you make 
child by child, year by year, Mm -hmm. how much you're engaging them with the culture and how much you're not. Um, I talked to a, I talked to a mom um, recently, not recently, probably eight years ago, who was, she was really struggling with the decision of whether she should put her son in public high school or in a, in a private school. And what I told her is the public high school is the cesspool of Mm -hmm. our culture. Um, And And your son, you know, maybe he'll learn to stand up for himself and he'll learn to share the gospel, but it's going to, it's going to be vexing to his soul. It's like Lot when he was in Sodom. Remember what Peter says in his epistle, he says every day his righteous soul was vexed. So if your children love Jesus and they're in public school every day, their righteous soul is going to be vexed. And so you need to be figuring out a way to be like bringing massive support to them because their soul is just going to be attacked day yeah. after day after day. This mom put her son in the public school and within two months she pulled him out and she called me up. And she's like, Oh my gosh, you are right. It is just, it is just a cesspool. His friends are constantly just trying to push stuff on him and mm-hmm. putting, you know, challenging him to do all these things that he knows he shouldn't do. And, and she pulled him out and she put him in a, in a private school. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough to put kids in a situation like that where, um, you know, oftentimes I think they feel like they're standing alone or then they, they're the ones who um, get labeled as the bully because now you're telling this kid that what they're doing is wrong or, you know, whatever, whatever the situation might be. And that's a really hard place for kids to be. And so I love that. And we're like that with our kids. We're very intentional. You know, we travel a lot. We, we do a whole lot. Um, of things that are not homeschool related, but we, you know, we get to spend the days and hours with our girls training their hearts and training them up in righteousness, um, Mm -hmm. teaching them God's word so that when they go out into the culture, they can recognize good from bad, truth from lies. And, and I, and I agree completely. I mean, I've known kids who, you know, were homeschooled their whole lives and they came out and they were like, nope, not for me. And didn't, like you said, did not even know how to, how to interact with yeah. culture because their parents kept them so isolated and so yeah. protected. Um, and you can't do that, but it is our job to protect our kids. Um, yeah. and so you have to find that balance and that's what it is, is, is a balance. But I think sending them into that cesspool for 35 to 40 hours a week yeah, and then expecting them to come home and be able to undo everything that they've been taught and seen seems nearly impossible. Yeah to do because you can't undo what's already been done uh, yeah. to them. And so this last year, Leigh and I both read a book um, called um, the gospel comes with a house key by Rosaria Butterfield. Okay. Um, we really enjoyed that book and, and she's, she's a homeschool mom. Um, and how, how she, how she creates that space for her kids to learn to reach out is by having a home that's constantly open. Mm, and so her yeah. kids are learning to make disciples because she's having unsafe people in her home all the time yep. and she's making disciples. And so they're seeing that. Yeah. Um, what happens oftentimes when somebody comes to Christ within about three years, they don't have any more non-Christian friends. Mm. Um, either their non-Christian friends have stopped being friends with them or yep. they've just stopped engaging with the world. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's important for like one of the reasons I'm part of a, a local running club is that gives me a space where I can interface with people in the world. My public school lets me, lets me do that. Um, my, my college students, I run a college ministry for my church and I have them in my home and they're constantly going out and bringing other people. Yeah. And those people are in my home. And part of my ministry is I do it with my kids. Mm-hmm. I minister in the context of family. I think that family makes you more effective in your ministry. And so my kids are learning it. When, if I go out and I'm sharing the gospel, I take my sons with me, you know, and yeah. they hear people reject us and they, they, they get to see how to share their faith. And so we just need to be making sure as parents that we're engaging with the world, mm-hmm. that we're letting the world into our home, you know, inviting strangers. That's what hospitality means, that's right. loving strangers. Well, so we're inviting strangers into our home. That's, that's how our kids are going to learn to make disciples, sending them off away from us where they can't be learning from us and seeing us model it and knowing how to do it. Not, not really effective. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I agree completely. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately we are out of time for the <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah. but I would, if you can stay on with me, I would love to continue this conversation because I oh, want to keep sure. talking about 
um, this. So for those who are Backstage Pass members, um, this video, of course, will be on and you guys can view the rest of this interview. Um, for those who are listening on the podcast, thank you guys for listening today. Um, we are so grateful for you. We're grateful for the encouragement that you continue to bring to us. Um, continue praying for us. God is doing some big things with um, Schoolhouse Rocked and with the podcast and with our family. So we would love your continued prayers as we move forward in post-production with the movie and um, just continue doing what God has called us to do. So thank you guys for your encouragement. Thank you for listening. And please, please share this with your friends. It's always um, exciting to hear when someone says, oh, I had a friend who told me about this podcast. And I got to talk to a dad the other day. Um, and the mom actually said, oh, my husband, Ryan, always listens to the podcast. And he's always the one telling me, you got to listen to this one. You got to listen to this one. And I was like, that is awesome. I, I love that dads are listening as well. So hi to the dads listening. And hello, Ryan, I'm glad you're listening. Um, but thank you guys for being with us today. And uh, we will have a new podcast for you next Monday. And for those of you on the Backstage Pass membership site, um, stick with us and we're going to continue this conversation with Caleb. So Caleb, thank you for being on the podcast with me today. Oh, for sure. Thank you for having me. A huge blessing. All right, hold on one second. Okay. Um, I, I want to I talk a little bit deeper about what's actually happening in the in the culture of the public school system. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I hear we're, we're from California, um, just like you, which is how we know you. Um, and so we're, we're removed from it a little bit right now, but we still hear of all the craziness uh, mm -hmm. that's happening. And I know it's not just in California that these things are going on. Um, you're on the inside. We often yeah. hear, it, it almost feels like hearsay. And sometimes to be quite honest with you, I hear about things that are happening in public schools. And I think that can't be true. Like that, that can't actually be happening. Maybe it's happening at one or two schools, but it, it certainly can't be happening all over the country. And several months ago, I had an old friend um, from high school. She, she called me and she was considering taking her kids out of public school. And she's in Northern California, actually. And so she just said, yeah, just talk to me about this homeschool thing, you know, cause I, I feel like I need to take them out, but I, I don't understand homeschooling and I just don't know. And she, she really didn't know a whole lot of what was happening in her own kid's school, even though she was involved. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing some research and there were some things that I just found that just appalled me in mm -hmm. a million different ways. Um, you know, one of the things I saw was, um, the state of California, of course, um, you know, you can take a girl at any age to have an abortion mm -hmm. and you not only do you not have to tell her parents, but you're not allowed to tell her parents. You could take a little girl to murder her baby mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to tell her parents or, you know, kids can come in and, and they can say, you know, a little boy can come and say, yeah, I think I'm going to be a girl today. And mm -hmm. they have to honor that and they can't tell his parents and right. they've completely removed parental authority from everything that they're doing with these kids and they have become the authority. And mm -hmm. I hear these things and I read them and I know that they're true. And then I think, but certainly that can't be Yeah. like, uh, so how, what is the culture looking like as a, as a public school teacher, what are you faced with day in and day out? And then how have you seen that change over the years? Cause you've been teaching in the public school system for quite some time. I mean, years. Yeah. Yeah. So for a long time. Yeah. So you've seen, I'm imagining quite a shift from when you first started teaching to what is happening now. Yeah. Um, so, so talk to us about it. What's going on? So, um, I really don't think I would have survived as long as I have. Um, if I was in, um, like LA unified school district, um, I am in, uh, Kern County, and Kern County is the wild west of California. That's how we like to describe it. <laughs> uh, so in the community that I teach in, um, our biggest claim to fame is we have the Willow Springs Racetrack, um, mm -hmm. which is one of the original um, paved serpentine racetracks, or I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's popular. So that employs a lot of people in our community. I don't know if you know NASCAR folk, but they're mm -hmm. usually pretty conservative. Um, the next big employer in our community is the Air Force Base. Right. Um, and usually Air Force personnel are more conservative. So all those laws have gone into effect. So, you know, if a boy decides he's a girl, he needs to be allowed to use the girl's restroom, locker room. That's the law that we have mm -hmm. to observe. Um, and we have had 
a couple kids in our in our school who have decided they want to play that game. Um, and so it's sort of up to the school for how they're gonna how they're gonna deal with it. Um, because I'm in a conservative community, um, they've they've dealt with it very cautiously. Um, so we have all of our restrooms locked, and we let one kid in the restroom at a time. Mm. Um, there has to be a security guard at every restroom, um, and and that's a problem, you know. But mm -hmm. that's that's how we deal with it, you know. Um, they have to in the health classes the the thing having to teach the children. They're required to teach the children about all of the different genders now and all the different ways that those genders can have sex. Mm. So the sex ed piece of, of health has gotten very, very crazy. Um, I mentioned that my daughter is in my public school. Um, and so she's, she's independent study, but she still has to do, you know, the state approved curriculum. And so this last semester, her teacher came to me and she was like, hey, um, I can do the health course, the full health course, or I could do the health course without the sex ed piece. You can elect to not have sex ed for her health. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> you know. And so like in a conservative community, the way we interpret it, we can sort of say, oh, we didn't get to that. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. We didn't get to that part of the curriculum. I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's ways around it. My dad taught for 37 years. He taught intelligent design in the public high school, mm -hmm. right? Um, his students actually would actually sort of get confused sometimes. They'd be like, wait a second, Mr. Schrader, are you, are you saying that you believe intelligent design? Or are you saying that you believe in evolution? Because he wouldn't tell them what he believed in, mm -hmm. but he would present both sides of the argument. And then the kids would sometimes be like, wait, what side are you arguing for? We don't understand. So eventually one of his students made him two hats. And one of them says intelligent design and one of them says evolution. So he'd put the hats on when he was arguing from the different views. So the kids would sort of like be able to keep track of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So in my conservative community, we've sort of been protected from that. But what you'll notice um, in California right now, over 10% of students have left the traditional public school. Um, and they're going to charter schools that don't have to stick to the same crazy curriculum rules that some of the public schools have to stick to. Um, they can have a little more freedom for how they do things. Um, they're going to private schools and they're homeschooling. Um, there's a lot of of charter homeschools in California now where kids are being taught independent study through charter schools and they have a lot of freedom. So there's, there's a ma mass exodus. So mm -hmm. every year um, they're, they're losing thousands of students from the public school system because parents in California are fed up with it. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's interesting is during the Obama era, I don't know if a lot of conservative people realize this, Obama actually was a big proponent of the charter schools. Mm -hmm. But like these public schools are failing our kids. They need a little bit of competition, a little bit of competition never hurt anybody, which isn't usually what you hear from a liberal, right? Um, and so he started um, sort of supporting those systems. And it was sort of one of the first times that in California, our union didn't have a lot of support from the Democrats. Well, now it's shifted. Um, and so I don't know if you follow, follow the recent teacher strike in LA, a lot of that had to do with the massive amount of students that they've lost to charter schools. Mm -hmm. so the public schools are losing funding. And the decision they made after that strike was a huge sort of um, blow to the charter schools, the homeschool parents. Um, they're going to start making it harder for parents in California to homeschool. Um, how is been, that? Well, um, how, how they're doing it is through our uh, through our social care program. So they're trying to get legislation passed that if you um, have an affidavit, so in California, you have to file an affidavit if you're homeschooling your children. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to get legislation passed where if you file an affidavit, then you have to be visited by a social worker. Mm -hmm. um, in California, social workers have absolute power. Mm -hmm. um, so if a social worker comes in and uh, decides you're a bad parent, they can tell any lie they want to the judge. Mm -hmm. You have no recompense whatsoever. Yeah. You can't do anything to get your kids back. One of my, one of my good friends is going through this right now. Mm. They're taking her, her son away. They're about to take her other two kids away. They're um, accusing her of abuse um, and there's no abuse at all. Um, and so, and it's just her word against a social worker and the social worker doesn't like her. Yeah. And it's like, it's not a normal court situation at all right. where you have a lawyer. It's guilty you until it's they decide guilty, that you're not. Period. So yeah. like she, she can't even like call other moms who've been in these situations and are like, this lady's lying. She can't even call them to testify. Wow. Um, so it's, 
it's getting scary here in California. Um, but what I, what I tell people, the safest place to be is where your shepherd tells you to be. Yeah. And so right now I know this, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be on the front lines of this. I'm not going to put my kids in the public school. And, um, and there's ways for me to get around um, those bills going through. So far, they haven't gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, this last election, our state got a lot more liberal. And um, they're getting away with a, a lot of things. Um, but we can't make decisions based on fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, there's, there, the, there's a battle brewing. Um, mm-hmm. Our enemy recognizes that what we're doing is preventing him from having the minds of our child, children, and mm-hmm. he hates it. And he's coming after us, and he has a lot of people who are doing, doing his bidding. Um, yeah. So that he has a strong foothold in California. And it is, uh, it, it is scary, um, but I know, I know whom I have believed in. So that's, yeah. that's why I have hope. So, so what can parents do? What can Christian homeschool parents um, and Christian public school parents do to fight against this culture war that's going on? Um, in addition to praying, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say to, to keep yourself educated, you know, um, pay, pay your dues with HSLDA and like mm-hmm. be following them, be paying attention to the cases that are going on in California um, and, and be, be praying specifically by name for the different situations. Mm-hmm. Be involved in a homeschool community, you mm-hmm. know, um, whatever it is, whether it's classical conversations or another one find a homeschool community so that you're aware when these things are going on. So you can be providing support um, to the people that surround you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, and, and we, what I think, what I'm confident of, <laughs> I'm a public school teacher. It's not going to be hard at all for homeschool students to outperform public school students. Right. So do a good job of educating your children. Mm-hmm. And um, guess who's tomorrow's leaders are going to be? Yeah. They're going to be our children. And um, the, the liberals are aborting themselves out of existence. Un- unfortunately, I, I mean, that's sort of a, maybe a crass way of saying it, but um, are there, they, they're not interested in having families mm-hmm. um, and homeschool parents as a rule have really large families. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know of several, I, I have six kids and I know several families that have more kids than I do. Yeah. And so as, as we stick to our guns, as we ho- hold on to our children and we educate them and we, we don't just educate them out of fear, but we recognize that Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't stand against it. And we need to have that attitude in, in this um, battle for the hearts of our children and for the hearts in our communities. And so what that means is um, we don't we don't try to homeschool in a bubble. We homeschool with our wi- our doors wide open. Yeah. And what happens when when your unsaved neighbors are coming in and they see your kids, they are blown away. They're like, what, what in the this is amazing. What you're yeah. doing to the children here is amazing. You know, they see their they see that they're learning Latin and they see they're reading the classics and they hear them studying with each other and they hear them talking about the books they're reading. They're just like, yeah. what? Like my kids. I, I can't even get them to read a graphic novel, you know? Um, and, and, you know, um, um, so, so like when, when homeschoolers actually live transparently mm-hmm. in their communities, what's going to happen? Word's going to get out. Um, yeah. But the temptation is what if somebody reports me or what if somebody, you know, t- tells people what I'm doing, what you're doing is good. What you're yeah. doing is awesome. And so shine that light. Shine the light to the people around you. Be inviting people over for meals in your home. Have barbecues. Do block parties. Invite people over and do an amazing job of discipling yeah. your children. And, um, and, and we'll win a generation. Yeah, that's right. And, and the best way to disciple them is to teach them the word of God. And, yeah. you know, Ephesians 6, when they lay down, when they walk, when they stand, when they, you know, every, throughout the day. Yeah. always looking for opportunities. You talked about that with your dad and how he would just take you out and he just, by his very nature, he introduced you to the nature of God and, and yeah. the creation of our, of, of our Lord. And there are so many opportunities that we have to point mm-hmm. our kids to Christ. And when we take advantage of that, 
day in and day out. And when, when we are not sending them off into a system that's teaching them everything that's contrary to the word of God, yeah. we have the ability to teach them. And, you know, it doesn't mean that they have to know Latin. It's okay if your kids don't know Latin. It's okay if your kids don't reach calculus. It's okay if they're not historians or scientists or whatever, you know, they are going to be who God created them to be. And that's the beauty of homeschooling is we get to, we get to cater to our kids learning style, to their desires, to how God has created them individually. And they will make a difference in this world. Mm -hmm. And and I love your stance on, you know, be hospitable, open up your home Mm -hmm. to people and they don't have to be just homeschool people. Invite the neighborhood kids over. We had a house that we did that with, um, several years ago and we we had a nice backyard and um, we had one of those big Costco play sets and so we would invite all of the neighborhood kids to come over to our house and it was so much fun and I remember one summer we took it was like 12 neighborhood kids to VBS at our Mm -hmm. church that year and they were so excited and then we moved to another neighborhood and we did the same with those kids and we brought those kids to church with us and they're still going as a matter of fact when we went back um, to California a couple, well, I guess it's about a year and a half ago now. Um, we, we went back to our home church and the neighborhood kids who would go every week when we were there, they were still going. And That's it was awesome. so exciting. And these are kids who come from a very broken home. Yeah. Uh, but grandma would take them and she was there and we were so excited to see them there. And we thought, well, this is it. You know, this is the purpose yeah. of coming alongside of our neighbors and love your neighbor as yourself. And yeah what a great opportunity we have to be able to do that as homeschool so, families. Let me tell you about one, like that, that reminded me of just this amazing opportunity we have in California right now. So because our state is liberal, mm-hmm. um, they require schools to allow any club to have a presence on campus. Mm. Um, so that includes child evangelism fellowship. Yeah. Um, in our community in California right now, we can't keep up with the requests from local principals for us to have a good news club on their campus. Wow. Um, we're, if we, we just need more people who will help staff those. And the primary people who are staffing those mm-hmm. are homeschool families. Yeah. You know, they're the, the teenagers from some of these homeschool families. The, the good news club is usually at the end of the school day. So it's like 2.30. So a lot of, you know, working mm-hmm. professionals can't do that. But the homeschool moms and their kids, they can go do that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't know if any of your listeners are familiar with their local CEF, but CEF loves homeschool families and you get to bring your kids on the public school campus and be salt and light right there with you. Yeah. And what you're doing, you're sharing missionary stories, you're sharing Bible stories. I don't know mm-hmm. if you're familiar with CEF, but it's, it's one of the largest mission organizations in the world. Wow. And, um, and that's, that's really how, how missions is done in America. It's through, we call it backdoor evangelism. Yeah. You reach the children and then through the children, you reach the parents. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a, the harvest is ripe. There's the, the workers are few. And yes. so there's so many opportunities in California to be on those campuses and to be doing, to be doing outreach. You don't have to send your kids to public school to send your kids to public school. Yeah. You have a presence right there and do amazing things with your children um, in your in your local community through CEF. So I'd en- encourage your listeners to look up their local CEF chapter and try now, to Now, is that them. similar to Young Life? Because yeah. I'm familiar with Young Life. Yeah. Young Life is usually sort of like junior high, high school age. Oh, okay. Um, and then there's also, my, my high school actually has a campus life program. Okay. Which, which is another one. But CEF is for elementary school age kids. Oh, okay. Go up through junior high. Okay. But yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort of the first one that was ever started. It's been around for a long, long time. Have you ever okay. seen like the wordless book? That's a CEF thing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll link back to those um, in the show notes. I just did an interview recently with Elizabeth Johnston, the activist mommy. I don't know if you're mm-hmm. familiar with her, but um, we were talking about the impact that we can have on um, abortion clinics um, mm-hmm. and, and pro-life centers. And, you know, as homeschoolers, we have such a great advantage because we have we have time. And I know that there are homeschool moms who are rolling their eyes at me going, I don't have time. I don't have extra time to do anything because I've got my kids with me all day. Yeah. There's time for ministry mm-hmm. when God calls you to it. Yeah. You know, pray and ask God, what are you calling our family to pray with your kids? Get on yeah. your knees, pray and ask God to show you and your kids what ministry you can be involved in. And he will give you the time yeah. to be involved in those ministries because yeah. he does that. He, yeah. he, he wants us to serve in his world. And I think as Christians, so often 
we get into our little bubble of church and homeschooling and and we forget that there's another world out there who desperately needs to hear about Christ. Yeah. And you know, I've really I've been thinking a whole lot lately about um just those who are in in leadership in our country um who are making all these horrific decisions and taking the lives of innocent children and and telling lies to these kids who are so confused about, you know, their gender identity and this and that. Mm -hmm. And, and it starts with our, it starts with our leadership. Mm -hmm. We need to be praying for those people. And, you know, um, I mean, obviously my heart breaks in a million different pieces for those babies who are being, um, whose lives are being torn out of their mommy's wombs. I just, I I can't even wrap my Mm -hmm. mind around it and how we as a nation are saying that this is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I just, again, read uh, one of my favorite books is The Hiding Place by Corey mm-hmm. Ten Boom. Um, for those of you who have not read it, I, please read it. I, I think, I mean, you know, if I was stranded on a desert island and I could only take three books with me, it would be The Bible, The Hiding Place, and The Little House on the Prairie series. That mm-hmm. counts as one book <laughs> <laughs> to me. Um, but I love The Hiding Place. And one of the things I love about that book is that um, Betsy, who's Corey Ten Boom's sister and their father, um, Casper Ten Boom, they are so passionate about praying for those who are torturing and mm-hmm. executing, you know, mm-hmm. all of the innocent people mm-hmm. and their, their hearts break for them. And, and there, you know, a couple of circumstances where, you know, Betsy will just say, oh, I feel so sorry for them when mm-hmm. someone's being tortured and Corey's saying, you know, she's thinking, she's talking about the person being tortured and she's not talking about that person, though she feels sorry for them too. She's talking about the person torturing mm-hmm. because they need Jesus. Yeah. And, and if we're going to say that we care about human life, care about those people who are literally heading straight to hell yeah. and, and they need Jesus, yeah. they need him desperately. And so, you know, as, as homeschool families, we need to just be praying and asking the Lord, where would you have us to serve? Where would you have us to spread your truth and spread your gospel mm-hmm. to every end of the earth? We don't have to go to Uganda yeah. to be on the mission field. I love that you talk about, you know, you felt like God called you to missions. You are on the mission field, Caleb. Yeah. You yeah. are on the front lines. You are witnessing to these kids, witnessing to teachers. You are showing by your very life that you have Jesus. And so, and I know you're making a difference. I've known people, you talked about Christian earlier. Um, you know, I know people who you've had a great impact in their lives because you have taken a stand for what truth is mm-hmm. um, and use the platform that God has given you to be able to do that. So, yeah. um, I, th- I think one of the, one of the big uh, ways that we can reach out and make a difference, especially with the abortion issue is finding ways to support single moms. Oh yeah. Um, just, just, finding local networks to mm-hmm. be going there and doing classes for them. Yeah. Um, to do everything you can to give them support um, mm-hmm. and to not make them feel like there's nobody there for them. You know, right. that, that's really where that battle is going to be won. Um, mm-hmm. The way that we wage war in our culture is by loving the yeah. sinner. That's what I saw Jesus doing. And that's yeah. how he changed the communities that he was preaching the gospel of repentance to is by loving the sinners. Mm-hmm. And so we go in and we love we love those sinners well. We pray for those people who are making the decisions. We we go on the marches. You know, I, mm-hmm. I as a kid, I was out there with my sign. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, at our local hospital when they're trying to to have bring abortion here, and we got them out of here. You know, yeah. Um, and so, like you you do those things, um, and you're teaching your children as you do that, and you're mm-hmm. raising up a new generation of people who are going to be engaged in the culture. Right, um, and it, it's important to distinguish between being engaged in the culture and being at war with the culture. We're at war with sin. We hate sin, mm-hmm. but we love the people, and that's really where that's, right. that's where the ten booms got it right. They were yeah. praying for people. They hated their sin, but they but they loved those people well, and even just praying to God to give you that love. It said the Holy Spirit has shed abroad His love in our hearts, and so we have that love for those people. And when we act out of that, when we pray out of that. Um, that's what's going to change this world. And that's yeah. what's going to teach our children well. Yeah. And, and it's, it's when we realize what we've been saved from. Yeah. And we're still sinful too. You know, we're just as sinful as the next person. Um, but we, I was just talking about this with my girls the other day, saying there's a difference between being a sinner and living in sin. Yeah. And 
we are all sinners desperately in need of a savior. Um, and once we realize what we've been saved from, we will, we will have such an just earnestness to go out and share that with other people. You know, yeah. when, when you eat a dessert that is so unbelievably delicious and you bring your friends all around you, you want to say, oh, you got to try this dessert. It's so good. It's the best chocolate cake I've ever had or, or you know, mm-hmm. whatever, cheesecake. Um, you know, you, you're excited and eager to share that with them. And yeah. we need to be that way with the gospel. We need yeah. to, to just cry out to the Lord to give us the boldness to share Christ with those who, who desperately need him because we are sinful too. Jesus yeah. died for us. He died for them. Um, I love that you talk about single moms and reaching out to them. We actually interviewed Mary Jo Tate for the movie um, and she was a single mom. And, and we asked her, you know, what is the one thing that, that single moms need? And she said, they need other people to come alongside of them and mm-hmm. help them. And if that means coming alongside of a single mom and saying, I know that you're not comfortable having your child in public school, but I know you have to work to provide for your children. Let me take some of the burden off of you and let me homeschool them. Mm-hmm. There's no better way to love. I mean, that is amazing. And I know of parents who are doing that. Um, we stayed with a really neat family in Tennessee, um, in, in Franklin, and they have a farm and they just, they have a really good friend, a really good family friend who is a single mom, just a really neat lady. Um, and this family has just kind of taken this mom and her son under their wing and she, they're part of their family now. And she helps mm-hmm. to homeschool their son. And, and, you know, we get so comfortable in her little, like, okay, it's going to, it's going to disrupt our homeschool day. If we bring on another child, it's okay. It's okay to disrupt your homeschool day just a little bit. If that's what God's calling you to do. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, step out, do something. Yeah. Yeah. As Heidi St. John says, get off the bench and do something. (laughs) You you know, my wife and she's, she's pretty awesome. But one of the things she's taught me is um, just go with it. You know, yeah. like a lot of times we're, we're so overwhelmed at the uncertainty of tomorrow. Well, look, what if I start having people in my home or what if I start going, doing these ministries? Really, it's messy, you mm-hmm. know, um, but be, be willing to have maybe a little more of a messy lifestyle, yeah. you know, um, like Rosaria Butterfield. I really highly recommend her book, but she just talks about these single moms from her neighborhood are just coming over to her house in the evening and all the laundry's on the table. So what do they do? They start, well, no, she says they just put it back in the dryer for her. Yeah. That's what they do, right. Um, or, you know, they help her with the dishes or they help her get dinner on the table. And so they're just doing life together. You know, yeah. that's something that, um, if you've ever read any of Edith Schaefer's writings, that's what she would do. Her and Francis Schaefer just, they did life together. Yeah. And so that's, that's how Christians are going to win this generation. One of the things I find about millennials, they love and they're desperate for community. They want connection. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're one of the least connected generations yep. because of social media and because yep. of all these issues, but they're desperate for that. And like having them into your home, it mm-hmm. goes so far to communicate the love of Christ. Yeah. And so a, you can really be <laughs> effective with doing that. Yeah. Who's visiting right now? Sophie, she's getting her jacket. <laughs> hi, Sophie. Well, Sophie, if you're going to be in there, you at least have to say hi. I'm over here. <laughs> you have to squat down. <laughs> hi, Sophie. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good to see you too. So Sophie is Caleb's oldest. Yep. And uh, we've known Sophie since before she was born. <laughs> and she's getting really tall. Yes, um, she is. So anyway, I love what God's doing with you. I love how he's using you. Um, mm. to impact his kingdom um, yeah. and that you're passing that on to your kids. It's, it's what me, it's all about. Let me just give a little bit of encouragement to your listeners. Yes, um, please. I personally am a very task oriented person. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a go-getter and I always have things that I'm doing and things that I'm pursuing. And, um, and God's really taught me to slow down and be present with my children. Mm. Um, I think that's extremely important, especially for homeschool dads. Uh, moms are there all day. They're going to be with their kids. Um, one of the one of the little things I did that I it might seem it might seem minuscule, but it's made a huge difference for me. I, I put an overstuffed chair in my son's bedroom, and so when I go in to pray with them at night, I sit in the chair, mm-hmm. and that, that makes just a huge difference for me because I'm instead of like okay, the task is pray and then and then leave. I sit down and I just I can sort of relax 
well, I just listen to them and I just mm-hmm. give them my ear and I give them my face and I let them tell me about their day. And I last, let them ask me the million questions that nine-year-old boys have, you yeah. know, um, anything from science to the Avengers, you know, they want to yeah. know. <laughs> that always like, come before bedtime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That bedtime turns them into, um, you know, philosophers, but, <laughs> <laughs> but just to be present with my, with my daughters, I, I pursue their hearts Mm-hmm. Um, I take them out on dates for Sophie just had her 14th birthday and I took her to uh, this local place the Odyssey I don't know if you've been to the yeah. Odyssey before it's, it's beautiful down in Granada Hills and then yeah. we went to the Pentagius and we saw Wicked on the oh, on the stage you know off Broadway and it's just it was a special time for me to let her know I love you and I'm here to protect your heart you mm-hmm. know as you as you go out in the culture and um, and just taking that time to slow down to be present with your family. We love reading. Um, we are constantly reading. For the month of January, we went completely off screens and we just read. And it was such a blessing. I would come home and all my kids would be sprawled out on the couch, all reading different books. Um, the weaker readers, we use Audible and they're listening. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just th- th- those are treasure times to just yeah. grow together. So just I challenge your listeners. You know, be be active in the culture, but understand that's something you do as a family, and mm-hmm. you can be present with your children while you're doing that. I love what you guys are doing, just taking your girls along with you. You know, this is our adventure. This is our family adventure. We're doing it together. That's how God designed the family to work: is to yeah. increase our ministry, not decrease it. That's right, and it's not always easy, and it's not always fun. No, nope. um, but it is always a blessing to be where God has called you to be, and to be doing what He's called you to be doing. Yeah. Um, he, he brings blessings and obedience. So yeah, for sure. Um, I love that. Well, thank you, Caleb. You are a huge, huge blessing to us. Um, thank you for what you're doing in the public school system. Thank you for being on those front lines and making a difference in the lives of these kids who desperately need to hear truth. Um, mm-hmm. For sure. You're doing that. So anyway, have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks for your time. Um, for those watching, thank you guys for watching. Um, thank you for continuing to stick with us um, through these. And um, go, I had mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, but we have a great interview with Caleb um, that we did for the movie, and there's a pretty good portion of it on, um, I think it's on Backstage Past Membership site, but you can actually see it for free. Um, so we will put a link to that in the show notes. So you can click on that if you haven't seen it yet. So, um, so thank you guys. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Beth.